Hi, my name is Michael from Save Us All Permaculture. Zones and sectors are a very important part of the design process. With zones, we're looking at marrying the way we move through the landscape, through the needs and resources required for the particular elements that we're putting within that landscape. The resources and the elements that require most amount of work, we put close to where we are, and the things that are more self-regulating, we put further away. Sectors are external energies that come in from off the site that can affect our site. By understanding these external energies, whether it be sun, wind, noise, pollution, we can understand where we can place these particular elements within inside the zones for maximum effect and minimal effort. Normally zones are shown like this, a concentric circle moving from the centre outwards, with the first in the centre being people, or the zone zero zero as some people like to call it, through to the zone zero which is the house where most of the energy is being spent, through to zone one where we're spending at least four to five times a day, zone two where we're looking at anywhere between once a day to several times a week, through to zone three once a week several times a month, zone four once a month, once every six months, and zone five, where we go through occasionally not to do anything except to go out and learn within that scape. Now, though traditionally it's shown as a concentric circle, it is not always the case with regards to our designs. What we do is we map out where we access our site, and from there we can determine how often we're in a particular activity node, and that become, that where we spend most of our time becomes our zone one, and it decreases exponentially. Zones let us arrange the parts of a design based on frequency of use. We can place elements to reduce work, resource use and maintenance, boost yields and diversity, recycle resources and can help maximise the number of useful connections. Zones tell us where to place the parts of a design in the best relationship to the other parts. The more times we need to visit an element, or the more care it needs, the closer to the house or the centre of activity it belongs. Zones progress outward from zone one to zone five, from most used and managed to least, from least wild to least disturbed. They are not circular, but are shaped by landform and access. When we're looking at our site and we're starting with a blank site, we always start with our house in the centre where we spend most of our time, where we spend most of our energy, and where that most resource is being used, which is typically in our home. That is what we call our zone zero, or the house. From there, we move outside that into what we've talked about as our zone one, which is our domestic zone, is where we grow most of the bits and pieces that we need and that we visit on a very regular basis, anywhere up to four to five times a day. When you're looking at the zone one or the domestic zone, we're looking at the most visited intensive use and care. So when we're looking at structures that could potentially be within that scape, we're talking about a trellis or an arbor, a deck, a patio, a bird bath, a greenhouse, storage, compost, or even a workshop where we're going to on a daily basis for our work. Plants, we're talking about herbs and greens and flowers and dwarf trees and perhaps a favorite shrub of some sort. Um, low shrubs and lawn for being able to walk through on our bare feet or for children to run around in if we've got our children. When we're looking at a garden within that space, what we're talking about is potentially intensive weeding and mulching. We're talking about dense planting and espalier across any sort of surfaces that we can use to maximise what we're growing in that space. When we're talking about water, we're talking about rainwater tanks, small ponds, grey water and household tap water as well. Animals that can come into our zone one, we're looking at wild birds, potentially chickens, quail, guinea pigs, any of that sort of like. And uses, we're talking at modifying the house microclimate, we're looking at daily food, flowers, and it's a social space as well. It's where we spend most of our time, outside of the house. Then we get into our zone two, which is the home orchard system. When you're looking at that, we're going into this space about once a week to three or four times a month, all right, depending on the maintenance res maintenance required as far as the elements we're putting into that section of our design is needed. 
So in our zone two, which we call our home orchard area, so it's intensely managed. Okay, there could be a greenhouse, there could be compost, there could be a shed, and there could be wood storage for the timber that we hold onto for our cooking and or heating. The plants that are going into that scape, we're looking at you know, stable crops for preserving. We could be looking at small orchard systems or fire retardant trees to protect our zone one or our zone zero. We're looking at um, other plants and other natives that could be in that space as well for habitat as well as beauty. In our garden, we're looking at spot mulching rather than densely mulching. We're looking at cover crops. We're looking at seasonal pruning with those trees rather than constant care. With water, we're looking at a well, if you're fortunate enough to have one, and I do know, do know a few people that do. Um, a pond, grey water, irrigation, swales, etc. Things that can actually hold the water in our scape and sink it within our soils. We're looking at animals, so potentially the chicken run. So if the chickens are in zone one, then the chicken run could be in zone two because it's not so intensely managed. Could be fish, could be bees and other in, uh, animals that we're looking within that scape. And uses, we're looking at home food production, potentially some market crops, plant propagation and wildlife habitat. In our zone three, or called the farm. So it's further away again. So we're looking anywhere between once a month and once every six months or so. All right. So in that space, we're looking feed for storage. We're looking at fields and shelters. We could potentially be cash crops, large fruit and nut trees, forage, shelter belts, seedlings for grafting going into there. In our gardens, there could be cover crops. There could be, a, a, we're looking at minimal pruning in that space as well. And we're looking at mobile fencing rather than fixed fencing as we would in a more intensive area. For water, we're looking at dams and swales still, and we're looking at storing our water into our soils, uh, which is the best place where we can store our water. For animals, we could be looking at cows and horses and pigs and sheep and goats and other larger animals. And uses are looks of cash crops, firewood, lumber, and pasture in that space. So it's more extensive rather than intensive. In our zone four, which we commonly call our forage zone, or it's semi-managed, so that's further away again. So we're getting out to once every six months um, or a little bit more than that. We're not going out there very often at all. Now, when we're looking at the forage zone, we're really looking at minimal care. It is more self-replicating in this place and it's more self-managed. So we only have to do little things rather than a lot. With our structures, yeah, there could be animal feeders. With our plants, it's firewood for timber and timber, forage, native plants. In our garden, we're looking at pasture and selected forestry. All right, when our water, we're looking at dams and swales, etc. For animals, we're looking still for our larger animals for the space that's required. And uses, it could be hunting, gathering, and grazing. And the last, but definitely not least, is the zone five for the wild. And while this is not a space that we go to very often, it's when we do go where we're looking to learn. It's not something that we manage, it is something that we go to learn from. So it's a teaching space, all right? And structures could none, or potentially a sit spot only where you can go to sit and learn and watch the interactions that are happening within that scape. Plants, we're looking at native plants and other habitat species that are happening in that larger area that's more self-replicating. In our garden, perhaps a little bit of light foraging that we could do within that scape. With water, we're looking at creeks, lakes and natural pools that that are, autumn, are there already that we haven't had to construct. We're looking at animals, so we're looking at native animals or other wildlife. And we go there for inspiration, for foraging, and for preservation.